Well, I'd like to start my talk by um, first acknowledging the my colleagues who worked me with me on this project. So um, the members from RECAN and from JAXA as well. So this project that we've been looking at has been to look at the potential uh, usefulness and the feasibility of a um, geostationary precipitation radar satellite. Um, the potential usefulness of the observations and to see whether or not we could use them um, for an NWP uh, data assimilation, um, specifically for typhoon and analysis and forecasts. So I will give an introduction to the geostationary precipitation radar satellite that we are considering. And I will then talk about the methodology for how we go about simulating the observations and look at whether or not uh, the observations will be useful and look at the, the, the issues and the challenges that come with this new type of instrument. Uh, and then I'll present the results from a perfect model Aussie that we performed with a tropical cyclone. So um, I just give a brief introduction to precipitation radar satellites. So um, PR satellites have obviously been around for over 20 years now, starting with the TRIM satellite uh, in 1997. So uh, this was the first PR satellite to be put into space and has, by all accounts, provided new insights of uh, global rainfall variability and new insights into 3D storm structures. And the success of that mission was then uh, succeeded by the, the GPM core observatory satellite, which launched in 2014 and is in current operation. And this is a network of low earth orbiting satellites with the first um, onboard dual frequency uh, Q-band precipitation radar um, instrument. So we're getting advanced information on understanding uh, rainfall precipitation in uh, globally. So the success of those missions has now prompted scientists to think about uh, a precipitation radar for the future. And space agencies such as JAXA are now considering um, putting up a, a geostationary satellite with a precipitation radar on board. And they're considering the uh, idea of having a dual frequency uh, Q-band uh, precipitation radar, just as the GPM has. Um, but obviously with the geostationary satellite, we have the advantage of higher observation frequency and global coverage. So if I look at then the specifications for this proposed GPR and compare with those previous satellites, we can see that one of the issues that we have, and that's going to be very technically challenging, is to have a much larger antenna size. So we are considering the feasibility of an antenna size of 30 meters by 30 meters, which is an order of magnitude higher than um, the, those previous satellites. But even with that antenna size, we're only going to be achieving um, approximately 20 kilometer horizontal resolution at Nadir. So, um, so this proposed satellite that uh, we are now planning for is um, is going to be still lo much lower resolution um, than those previous satellites. So we're not going to quite get the same amount of representation of convection in, in the observations. Um, but still we get the advantage of uh, higher observation frequency and global coverage. So it's a bit of a trade-off. So in this section, I will talk about the uh, methodology for simulating the observations. So um, Okazaki, my former colleague, he began this project um, three or four years ago now, and he started by performing a simulation, um, a nature run of uh, a typhoon from 2015, Typhoon Soldalo, which was the um, most intense hurricane in that year. And he performed this nature run uh, a three kilometer, very high resolution simulation performed with the scale model, which is the model that we built here at RECAN. And then using JAXA's joint simulator for satellite sensors software, he can then um, extract the information to obtain 3D precipitation data for this assumed um, GPR. 
So as I mentioned, there's going to be many uh, important issues and considerations and challenges with this new type of uh, satellite. So first off is that the GPR will be measuring precipitation over a much larger sampling volume. Um, and also that the sampling volume is going to be tilted because the geostationary is obviously in fixed um, orbit. So it'll be measuring precipitation um, with a, uh, a tilted beam span, with a tilted beam with the sampling span, sampling volume also tilted. So this is gonna lead to issues, um, of course, with non-uniform beam filling, which is expected to be very large for this uh, instrument given the resolution. Plus, um, when we're looking at off Nadir um, precipitation, there may be no precipitation around the beam center, for example, but the tip of the scattering volume may touch um, some precipitating area. And we could have instances where we receive um, signal from precipitation at uh, levels higher than the actual height of the precipitating error. So this, this is gonna lead to errors in our observations. Um, at the same time, uh, we're expecting the issue of surface clutter contamination to be very severe for this type of instrument. Again, because the, the beam and the sampling volume is tilted. So, um, and actually as with the wider incident angle, we would expect um, the contamination from surface clutter to be even higher in the observations. So we're expecting this to be um, quite a big important issue that we need to think about. And of course, then we have um, issues with attenuation. So there are many challenges with this type of instrument that we need to then consider. Um, this slide I'll show very quickly. This is just how we calculate observations from the nature run. So we're converting model hydrometers from the nature run um, to a total backscattering and extinction coefficients um, using this joint simulator software. And, and we're performing that for every model grid point, and then we're just integrating those values um, following a beam pattern, which we're assuming here to be Gaussian. Um, and then we just can calculate the power from precipitation by performing this uh, integration, which considers uh, range, range, scan angle, and uh, beam pattern. Okay, so let's move on then to what the observations will look like. So um, as I say, the horizontal resolution and the deer will be 20 kilometers. So it's a fairly coarse um, resolution that we're looking at. So if we compare against the nature run, for example, we can see that the observations are able to capture the large scale features of this typhoon. So this is typhoon Soldalor in its mature phase. So we can see that we're capturing the symmetrical form of the typhoon as well as um, higher precipitating areas, such as south of the typhoon center, um, and also the spiral outer convective bands, rain bands, um, but without any fine details in the convection structure. So um, if we look at the, the cross section on the right-hand side, for example, we can see that, again, we can pick out um, the, the, the overall structure to the precipitation, but the observations appear very jagged, and this is because we're sampling um, at an angle, the beam and the sampling volume is tilted, and, and this is what's causing this um, jagged distortioning effect to the observations. So we looked into what we could possibly do to um, reduce that uh, effect, reduce that and mitigate the impact from that. So what we looked into was to reduce the beam sampling span, so make the beam sampling span finer. So this is, we've still got a very wide beam width, for example, we're not changing that. It's still 20 kilometer resolution, but we're just sampling uh, at more regular intervals. So, so we can reduce the beam sampling span from 20 kilometers, for example, down to um, five kilometers. Uh, and when we do that and we regenerate the observations with the joint simulator, um, what we see is that we can make an improvement in the observation quality. 
so we can start to better define and represent some of these more uh, finer convective features such as the the outer spiral bands for example or the high intensity uh, rainfall uh, in the eye wall for example so there is an obvious and clear improvement in the uh, observations when we're performing this oversampling. Uh, and then if we just take a cross-section view through the center of the hurricane, um, we can see that we're, by oversampling, we can reduce a lot of that um, distortioning effect to the observations. So as you go from no oversampling, the 20 kilometer case, and you just make the beam sampling span finer and finer, you can get back to the, the closeness to the, the nature run in terms of the overall convective structures. Okay, so if I then move on to the OSSE study that we performed, so um, as a very first stage to this uh, investigating the usefulness potentially of these observations for NWP, we decided to perform um, a very simplistic perfect model OSSE study. So we're using the nature run generated by Okazaki. This is for Typhoon Soldalore, uh, which underwent very rapid uh, intensification. Uh, so this nature run was performed, as I say, with the scale model that we built here at Rican. Um, and then if we look on to the data assimilation experiments, um, so we, we had decided to perform six experiments where we're assimilating observations from using different sampling spans from 20 to five kilometer sampling span. And then we've got two experiments where we're simulating just conventional observations and a no DA experiment where there's no data assimilation at all. So, and this is just for comparison. So the data assimilation system that we're using is the scale LETKF that we use here at RECAN. Um, we have 50 ensemble members, and in these experiments, we're only updating certain model prognostic variables, such as pressure, uh, vertical velocity, and temperature, but we don't update the winds um, with these assimilation. We're assuming that the observations um, will be obtained every hour. So we have an observation frequency of one hour. So we're performing one hour cycling. Um, as I say, the resolution is fixed at 20 kilometers. And then we have uh, observation error of five uh, dBZ that we are um, assuming. So in each of these experiments, we perform um, warm up cycling first of this uh, domain two the higher resolution domain. So we have 18 hours of warm up cycling where we're just assimilating um, conventional observations and TT vital data. And then after 18 hours, those initial conditions um, are then the, the, the analysis are then the initial conditions for each of these experiments. So it's the same initial conditions. Okay, so looking first at the uh, mixing ratio analysis of combined hydrometers, after 12 DA cycles. So here I'm showing just the nature run, the experiment where there's no data assimilation at all, and just the no GPR where we're just assimilating the uh, conventional observations. We can see that the, the moisture analysis aren't very representative of the typhoon structure. Um, if we go on then to look at the analysis, the, mo the moisture field, when we are assimilating the observations, we can see that there's much better representation of the moisture uh, and the convective fields, the convective structures such as the outer spiral bands and the, the eye wall, the high, higher precipitation to the south of the typhoon center. And what we found is that when we reduced the beam span, we could improve the representation of convective structures. So we, we were seeing better representation of uh, the high precipitation uh, intensity uh, within the eye wall, for example. And also we see uh, a clear region which is representative of the 
Typhoon I. So there was a improvement in the moisture analysis when we were using observations of higher, finer beam snow. Okay, so um, looking on now at some of the forecasts. So we ran a, a one hour forecast for uh, of accumulated rainfall. Um, this is initialized after 12 data assimilation cycles. Um, and this is comparing the forecast for the 20 kilometer experiment and the five kilometer experiment. And we can see that the, there's a, a better representation of the rainfall uh, associated with the outer rain bands in the five kilometer experiment. So we're improving the moisture field in the analysis and also the rain in the forecasts. Uh, this is um, looking at accumulated rainfall over an 18 hour forecast. Again, comparing the 20 kilometer experiment and the five kilometer experiment. This forecast is after six data assimilation cycles. And you can see an improvement in the distribution of rainfall, uh, clearly with the five kilometer beam span. Um, this is showing 18 hour forecast of maximum wind intensity. Again, we saw improvement with the five kilometer case compared to the 20 kilometer case, uh, much more closer and more consistent with the nature run. Um, this is looking at typhoon track and intensity error. We didn't see uh, hardly any in impact on the track error, which is expected because we weren't updating the wind field. But what we did see was an improvement in the uh, mean sea level pressure analysis error. And we also found an improvement in the mean sea level pressure error with the forecast error with the five kilometer case. Uh, and specifically when we are simulating finer uh, beam observations, we were getting better uh, forecast errors in mean sea level pressure. So this is just my final slide. Um, so this is just showing why that is the case. So we looked at the direct impact of assimilating the observations. And what we obviously found was an improvement in the moisture field. So we were increasing the moisture in that storm environment, but also um, improvement an increase in the temperature within the typhoon core and an increase in the secondary circulation. So a uh, greater vertical velocity, which was driving a intensification of the uh, secondary circulation, which was driving that improvement in intensity uh, in the simulations. So that's, that was for the five kilometer beam span case. Um, so that's, I'm going to just finish there. That's my summary. Um, and just to say that my next step will be to perform uh, an imperfect Aussie uh, and to take into the considerations um, many of the things that we didn't consider in this by performing a perfect model Aussie. Thank you. Okay, thank you, James. Okay, thank you. So we have three questions so far. Uh, the first one from Marek Jacob. How would radar side ropes affect the simulation results of GPR? Uh, okay, so um, if we included consideration of side lobe, we would expect uh, a more severe contamination of the observations through severe through surface clutter. Um, actually, I think my colleague Okazaki looked into the um, changing the, the the actual beam and, and considered side lobe. And, cons and I think he, he, he found that there was greater um, contamination through surface clutter. So that's another one of those and another considerations that we need to think about going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that second question from Philip Griebwank. Does reducing beam span have any negative effects? Um, uh, well, well, we didn't see any negative effects from reducing the beam span. All I would say is that uh, these results are probably on the optimistic side because of the considerations that we had. So I would say that we need to look into more and to understand whether or not the improvements are as good as we found. But there was no negative effects. Yeah. Great. 
Okay, the, the final question from Yufei Zen. Is it worth trying to change R matrix for different beam resolution? Uh, the observation error. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, we could try that. We could try to uh, include consideration into uh, observation error correlation, but I think that's a lot more difficult to do. Um, if we try to use uh, a more complicated R matrix structure, I think it's certainly something that would be interesting in the future, but I probably maybe not a priority. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, James.